following podcast is a production of Radio Felician, the voice of Felician University of New Jersey and the home of alternative rock done right. Available via iHeartRadio. Tune in, the Radio Felician app, and at RadioFelician.com. Radio Felician University. Welcome to the Felician Lantern, shining a light on everything nursing. A podcast from Felician University in New Jersey, exploring current issues in healthcare, speaking to leaders in the field, and preparing the next generation of nurses. Your hosts are Dr. Daria Wazak and Dr. Elizabeth Van Dyke, Associate Deans of the Felician University School of Nursing. Welcome to the Felician Lantern. I'm Daria. And I'm Liz. The Felician Lantern is honored to bring you our latest podcast focused on nurses and health policy. Our esteemed guest is Dr. Marcel Agnovskaya, otherwise known as Dr. K, who has a unique firsthand perspective on the legislative process. Dr. K received his DNP degree from Wagner College back in 2018. He's dual certified as a family and psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. He's certified by both American Academy of Nurse Practitioners and American Nurse Credentialing Center and holds certifications in vascular access and critical care. He practices at the VA Medical Center in the Bronx as a general surgery nurse practitioner and at a behavioral health center in Clifton, New Jersey. His latest research is focused on ultrasound guided phlebotomy and his work recently was published in Nursing 2023. This groundbreaking work is implemented throughout several vascular access initiatives within the VA system. Dr. K is the recipient of numerous honors and awards throughout his career and is an active member of many professional organizations, including the Society of Psychiatric Advanced Practice Nurses. Finally, Dr. K serves as an assistant professor with us here in the Graduate School of Nursing at Felician University. We are so honored to have you here. So um, just kind of setting the background and, and the stage for our discussion today, our podcast, um, I was looking through the Journal of Nursing Scholarship and noted um, a, an article in 2020 it was an integrative review of 22 articles uh, looking at, you know, nurses and in, in that are entering or, or being a part of the, uh, the, the, the health policy um, and it found that um, with this review, a low to moderate involvement of nurses that are working in policymaking. The article concluded that nursing institutions need to prepare and encourage nurses to work as policymakers and advocates. It's our desire that you will come away from this podcast with a renewed enthusiasm for policymaking process and how you can begin your journey to improve the safety and quality of healthcare. So, Dr. K, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited for this, and I think it's really important to advocate that policymaking is a driven factor for making change the way that you seek health care and the way that we seek health care and how patients deserve to receive health care. And I think that is a really important topic. And thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. So thank you. So I think the first we just want to kind of get a little bit of more of a background. I mean, you have quite uh, quite a, 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 um, a, a resume, quite a bio. So what inspired you to enter the arena of healthcare policy? So that's a really good question. Um, and I would have to say it kind of came to me rather than me go to it. Um, I think that working and being duly certified in the state of New York and New Jersey, I saw a significant difference in the way that um, APRNs, APNs, nurse practitioners, all synonymous for advanced practice nurses, are um, number one, utilized, number two, treated, um, both in the legislative process and two, in actual practice. Um, and that kind of opened up my eyes to say, wow, um, something that's less than a mile away on a bridge can really be so different in the way that you practice. Um, in the Bronx, I don't have a collaborating physician um, as a, a nurse practitioner. Even though I do work in surgery, um, I 
you know, collaborate with my colleagues on a regular basis, um, but I don't have a collaborating physician where in the state of New Jersey, I'm so limited, I need to have one. And having one really puts a huge burden on the cost of the healthcare system and the organization that you're working for. And if you want to do it on your own and have your own practice, it also is a huge um, offset for costs. And a lot of the times the collaborating physician does not really participate in the care. Um, so that really inspired me into entering the healthcare um, policymaking business. And I have to tell you, it's been a, a huge learning curve, a very interesting, um, and lots of changes have been made so far. Dr. K, tell me how the New Jersey legislative process works, just in, in general, an overview. Sure. So the New Jersey legislative process, I had to learn this through, um, through the Society of Psychiatric Advanced Practice Nurses. I'm going to refer to them as the Society. Um, one of my mentors uh, at Fairleigh Dickinson, when I got my psych NP, she was also my preceptor, um, asked me to be uh, the chair of the legislative committee because she, you know, believed in my, um, you know, policy making um, uh, efforts. So. I met with a the um, we have uh, what we call lobbyists, and they kind of educated me on this process, and it was a huge knowledge gap that I had. So, if you want to have, let's say, a bill introduced into uh, law, they recently did, for example, no smoke in the OR. So, when somebody does cauterizing, um, it causes smoke. Uh, somebody has an idea. Let's say Nurse Sally has an idea, um, and when that idea is put into fruition, a bill gets drafted. Um, and when you draft the bill, you have to make sure that the nomenclature is really to the jargon of, I would say, like a lawyer would write, um, because it's presented in essentially a courthouse in law. So that gets drafted. That's a very uh, cumbersome process. It takes a long time. A lot of the times it's beneficial to work with a lobbyist. Um, once that's put in, then it goes to um, the final process for review, and then it gets presented to the uh, committee. So there's various committees in the state of New Jersey. There's um, budget committee, uh, environmental committee, and this would be the health care um, health policy committee, which is um, chaired by Senator Vitale. Um, and they would introduce the bill. Um, we would have a moment, once you have um, sponsors, we would have to meet with various, there's 40 districts um, in the state of New Jersey, and there's uh, various um, you know, senators uh, that you have to meet with and kind of get their buy-in, and you really have to sell it because a lot of these folks are not healthcare people. They're, one person was um, you know, a teacher, and you have to explain what an advanced practice nurse is, the difference between that and a PA and resident. Um, so it, basically, the process would go as such. The bill gets to the committee. The committee then, you'd have a moment to testify. Um, once the testifying is done, the committee votes. Then there's a second or a third review. At times, then it goes to the floor. After the floor, once the Senate, because that's the Senate committee, then it would go to the uh, assembly. The assembly is a whole nother process. And then finally, the Senate assembly would vote. They don't all have to do it at the same time. Each can have its own process. Sometimes the health committee could even send it over to the budget committee, and that can be its own vote as well because budget is involved. So it can be very bureaucratic. It can feel very frustrating at times, um, but it's a very long process that you have to be patient and you have to, it's more of the journey through it and kind of have an end goal to really reach what you want. So it's a, essentially that's the process in, in, a, in a nutshell. <laughs> and how does it ultimately get passed? Sure. So the bill ultimately gets passed um, after reaching the assembly. You would have you need more than 51 plus one over 50 percent of the vote. So in the Senate, there is 40 members. And so you need 21 votes. And then in the assembly, there's 80 members and you need uh, 41 votes. So each region, uh, as I mentioned, there's 40 of them. They have two sen uh, one senator and two assemblymen or women. Got it. So if uh, one wants to change a healthcare policy or practice, um, how do you start? I know you mentioned before about working with a, um, you know, working from the lowest level and kind of working your way up. Um, so how would that work? What would you recommend uh, for our listeners out there who might have a really great idea um, that really want to kind of work on making a policy change? Yeah, so um, that's a really important point and a, and a really 
I would say there, this question can be answered in multiple ways because you can go through many routes of how you want to make a change. Um, I am big on supporting grassroots initiatives, um, and it has to make sense with the legislative process, and it ha you have to get buy-in. So, for example, if I want to make a change in hospice and palliative care, I would look at the hospice and palliative care organization in New Jersey. I would also look at the New Jersey Nursing Association, which is extremely a powerful resource to have. Um, putting a process through requires a buy-in from legislators, like I mentioned earlier. So you really have to have also a financial support, not to defeat you know, the purpose and to say that, oh, I don't have the, mon uh, the money or the means or the resources to put this, you know, together, um, it requires a lot of thought. So if I want to make, let's just say, um, I'm going to give an example of the uh, Death and Dignity Act in the state of New Jersey. It was not a bipartisan you know, vote at all. Um, to euthanize at the end of life is a very difficult topic. Um, a lot of conservative folks will not support that bill. Um, and it passed. We became actually one of the first states to um, participate in that. And nurses were a huge, uh, you know, factor for that because we're at the bedside and we see the person suffering. We see them wanting to go and, you know, truly wanting to make that change. So I think that those nurses, for example, looked at their local organizations and those local organizations took further into their regional organizations and, and they kind of had that support and pushed it through. So while an idea may be excellent and it may be great, it also has to benefit I like to use utilitarianism, everybody. Um, it has to really serve a purpose for the greater good for all rather than just, you know, my own purview, my own perspective. So while, yes, there could be a change, it has to start from a grassroots initiative that reaches out to your local uh, resources and communities. Now, I know you mentioned before something about lobbyists. So what is the connection between grassroots and lobbyists, or is that two different routes of kind of working? Is it more lobbyist kind of with more financial? That's what I always think of. Or how does how does that play out? So yes, lobbyists are, and they are expensive, um, but they do hold your hand through this process. And I have to say that the lobbyists that we work through in the society are so helpful. Um, for example, um, I wanted to start a grassroots initiative by uh, mailing letters to my local legislative uh, processes. Um, and they basically said, we're not there yet. We have to, while we can get the letters through, in order to really kind of hone in on it and get it home, we really need that secure that 21 votes. So they'll walk you through the process to not be so gun ho and making things, you know, kind of don't trip yourself before you kind of uh, are there. Um, and I think that that process was so helpful because it kind of made me realize I like I like to say um, this little uh, quote that one of my mentors told me, don't eat the rice while it's hot. Um, and it's true. You, you don't want to, you know, go in there and eat the hot rice because you can kind of burn your tongue and you have to be really patient. And it's more of like thinking as a lawyer. Um, you know, and having the legis um, the lobbyists helping you with this legislative process is so helpful because they understand the system way more than any, I would even say more than a lawyer would because they know the players and they know the folks and they've been around, they go to their conventions, they go to their supporting, um, you know, uh, dinners. They really know the players in the game and, and that's part of the battle. You really have to be um charismatic. You have to sell yourself in a way that, you know, you can get the buy-in from those folks, that, the teacher that may not understand what a nurse really does at the bedside, um, or the person who owns a law practice that may not understand the difference between an APN or an MD. Um, so having the lobbyist would really give you that, um, that help for sure. And you could also go to um, uh, online on New Jersey, uh, njledge.state.nj uh, is the website where you can see all your local uh, senators and assembly men and women, and you can see their bios and you can kind of say, okay, so this is a lawyer. I'm going to think like a JD now. Oh, this person knows healthcare. They have a, you know, a biochemistry degree. How can I break it down to them? So you almost have to know who you're selling your pitch to. And I have to mention, we had another podcast where we spoke with the Organization of Nurse Leaders in New Jersey, and they spoke about their role in the advocacy process, and they also have a lobbyist. So that that's an example of one of the organizations that we could partner with. This is the Felician Lantern, shining a light on everything nursing. Let's talk about the current bill that you're working on now. 
And if you could, as a second question here, tell me about that bill, but also kind of take me through the process of what it was like going in and testifying. What was that like? Yeah, so that day um, is forever engraved in my mind. Um, I would have to say that you, all the organizations in the state of New Jersey, um, including the one that you mentioned, uh, their lobbyist was there as well, um, supporting us. And I would have to say that there would be there was three people that were selected to testify, representing three different groups of APNs. The bill is for um, it's uh, S 150, uh, 1522 for full practice authority. Um, and the assembly has a different number, um, but they're both synonymously the same. Um, and it's to remove the collaborating physician restriction. It also has a ton of um, other, um, you know, uh, statements in the bill, uh, such as, um, you know, uh, various um, psychiatric things, for example, like 2PC commitment, things of that nature. The bill is really kind of to support advanced practice. And, you know, being one of the three people selected, I, I was very honored, but I was very nervous. Um, you know, I... I'm the new kid on the block, and it was uh, very stressful. Um, I was with Dr. Uh, Amita. Uh, she represents the uh, New Jersey uh, Nurse uh, New Jersey Nursing Association, and then we had Nick, who was representing the CRNAs, because CRNAs are uh, certified registered nurse anesthetists, are advanced practice nurses, and then I represented the society as a psychiatric. Um, NP as well as a family NP. So I was able to bring in both sides of the house. Um, when I get nervous, I trip a lot. <laughs> and I almost tripped going into my seat, which was kind of funny, but also I got their attention. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then you, you really, when you walk in, you can feel the tension. It's like, uh, it's like a courthouse uh, and, and you could just feel the tension. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of press, a lot of um, organizations, ARP was there. Um, very, very serious topics discussed. Um, the physicians had their um, point of view and they put the resident, their residents to discuss cases and scenarios where APNs um, were not so good at, you know, having full practice authority. And then we had the opportunity to go and also schools of nursing did a great job. They also went and testified. Um, and the three uh, folks that represented, I was one of them um, in this state. It was um, a lot of pressure, but the one thing that was used against us, which was interesting, which I felt like there was a reason why I'm here, um, was the Stanford study um, put out um, actually from the VA system uh, stating that nurse practitioners are more costly to healthcare and how we are not utilized well in specifically the emergency room the study focused on. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying to myself, I could have not gotten a better study thrown at me because I work at the VA. I know all this, you know, the semantics and the knowledge and nomenclature that's written in this article. And I actually read it and we discussed it at our national council. And I kind of was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. Um, so I kind of gave this information to my lobbyist, Lynn, who related to the Health Senate Committee, um, and they asked me to speak first. I wasn't supposed to. I was supposed to speak last. Um, so Senator Vitali calls on me and says, I hear that you have information of, about this um, study. Can you please share with us? And I did. I kind of like let them know, you know, that the term. So here's the the deal with the VA in in the healthcare system, um, which is government funded. It's not about cost. It's about revenue. It's those RVUs are calculated, and physicians have residents. So to each patient that a physician would see, they also have a resident helping them. So it's two against one. So that study is automatically not given the limitations about it. So I explained that to those folks uh, at the Health Senate Committee. And it was a lot of educating because people don't understand the, you know, the definitions of what, um, you know, productivity would be or, um, you know, labor mapping and those type of uh, language. So I kind of relate it through in my VA terms um, as best as I could and filtered it down, but it kind of showed and when I said that I actually work for the VA and I have a great collaborating relationship with my physician, I looked over to, to my physician colleagues and they were kind of like, oh, no. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you have to be careful with what evidence you support, wh whatever bill that you do, because it has to be peer reviewed and it has to be really put out there and your colleagues have to respect it. And this specific literature was not approved uh, or peer reviewed. It was just thrown out there at the um, AMA meeting. Um, <clears throat> so I think that, you know, with that being said, it was it was a lot of pressure, um, definitely. But I was able to handle it because I knew that 
at the end of the day, this is an important mission and this specific bill is really going to improve access to care in this state. I can tell you that there are folks that are waiting to see me um, three months, you know, booked schedules and having APNs practice under physicians and not being able to get a collaborator because some physicians will not support that. I can say that when I was looking for a preceptor, if it wasn't for my mentor, I wouldn't have had a preceptor. A lot of physicians didn't want that. So you have to kind of remember when you're testifying, it could be scary and it was, but at the end of the day, the mission was clear and I knew that the drive had it had to send it home and we really worked well together. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of what it was testifying. It was one of the, it was like kind of giving a wedding speech. Yeah. Are you <laughs> seated at the time that you're testifying? Yes. So you're seated, okay. you're seated and you're staring in front of um, the health Senate committee. Um, and they're all looking at you. They're like, like in a panel in front of you. Exactly. Okay. In like more like an oval, like half of an oval shaped and you're sitting there and, um, I like to when I when I talk, I like to make eye contact and move away um, because I feel like some people may not like eye contact. Some people do. Um, so you're kind of having to, um, you know, sell it in a way that you're not coming across very aggressive, like you're passionate about it, but you're not overzealous um, and you can't you're not really supposed to read off of a piece of paper. Mm. So you kind of have to have this stuff memorized um, because when you're reading off of a piece of paper, it's not as authentic. And you're not getting them, you're not looking them dead in the eye. You're not saying like, this is really important. This is because X, Y, and Z. Um, I talked about the statistics of suicide um, in the state of New Jersey, which was uh, astonishing. I mean, I didn't know that like 5% of high school kids try to commit suicide. They may not be successful, but they attempt. Um, that's a huge statistic. And after COVID, it increased. And I saw the literature supporting, it's controversial literature, but it does support that mental health has been on the rise, especially in young adults. And, you know, that was a really something I'm so passionate about. And I can see that that got the hearts of a lot of the committee members. And that really was the driving home factor. But I spoke first, which I didn't expect, but I still kind of capture the room's attention. And it was super, um, I would say, empowering because then it kind of laid the floor to my other two colleagues that kind of, you know, would testify. And we all worked in harmony really well. So it all came together. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. So I know you spoke about, you know, the challenges and the things that you were facing. Um, but then, so what are the beneficial outcomes? I know we've, we've kind of already said as far as full practice authority for nurse practitioners in the state of New Jersey, but it's so much more than that. It is not just, you know, removing the tether of a collaborative practice agreement from a nurse practitioner to a physician colleague. It is so much more. Agreed. It is so much more. Um, folks think that, you know, a collaborating physician is just a collaborating physician. Believe it or not, your collaborating physician doesn't even have to be in the specialty that you're in. And so I practice in mental health. I can prescribe, let's say, to a kid, um, Zoloft, let's just say, and I decide for a teenager for depression. And then I can have an OBGYN as my collaborator and say, oh, I don't, I don't prescribe Zoloft. Or I don't like it. And their name is on my prescription pad when I send it over to the pharmacy. And they may not agree with it. They can override my decision and prescribe something that's off-label um, for kids and approved in OBGYN. And it doesn't make any sense which is why this sometimes bills and legislation process, it's really important that the people who put them together are in that field because this is an example of how a situation can arise where it can create a lot of conflict and controversy. And that's just one example. Um, there are multiple. For example, if my collaborating physician has 15 APNs. If all 15 APNs have all a crisis that they need the collaborator, how does that benefit one where I collaborate with my colleagues? Like um, Dr. Van Dyke, like if I had a question when it came to APN practice, I would say, hey, what do you think about this? What is this antibiotic gonna do? Um, I heard about it, it's new, have you used it? Right, we collaborate, we're a healthcare team. And that restriction has really limited our practice in this state. And I think that having over 26 states now that have full practice authority, we're really going in the right direction. And I think that those are really the beneficial outcomes. The access to care, because post COVID with respiratory issues, cardiac issues, mental health issues, it has been so noted in the literature. It is visible. I mean, we can all feel it. It's very hard to get a provider. Yes, telehealth and all that is wonderful, but if we don't have the staffing to support it, we're not gonna get anywhere. 
You're listening to The Felician Lantern, shining a light on everything nursing. So what I'd like to do is just kind of leave some thoughts with our nursing students. Seeing your journey and everything that you've done, it might be intimidating for a new nurse even to think that they have a say, but they do. Especially if they're at the bedside, their testimony could be really powerful because they're right there doing the role and and can can speak with a lot of credibility to that end. What recommendations do you have for our new nurses out there or for any nurse in getting more involved in advocacy? Great question. Um, I am huge passionately about, very passionately about nurses governing and honing in on their own practice and really owning it and, and loving it. Um, I have to say social media is a huge influencer. It's changed a lot. Um, like even, you know, I'm Ukrainian and like looking at the war in Ukraine, social media has changed the outcomes of that war completely. Um, you're able to see live what's happening. Social media has the same influence in healthcare. We saw our nurses burnt out and exhausted post COVID. We saw them struggling. We saw the, the scars on their face after the N95s all day and coming home to their families and getting them sick and living in hotels. We witnessed that through social media. We did. And that was so powerful. And I think that that's one thing that the younger uh, nurses are really good with. They're really good with having a voice and speaking up and advocating for themselves. Um, whether it's millennials, Gen Zs, um, it's a different thought process. Really, it's you're looking at different um, age generations. It's not so much of how it used to be. The disconnect that I'd have to say is that the folks at the legislative process are not in the same generation. So you have to kind of find that balance. And there are some younger um, like Holly Shapizi, she's younger. She's more of um, a, a Republican senator, but she, you know, is a younger perspective. Um, there, there are senators that you're going to have to kind of know what their background is and their knowledge. But I think for nurses to truly do what they're good at and work together, it's not a single ship, right? It's, it's, it's collaboration. It's if I want to make a change, how can I reach out to my colleague who also fe- is feeling this? Is it meaningful or is it just me, right? So I think that that is important. And I think that if you want to make a change, be the change. I know it sounds kind of corny, but be the change that you want to be. Because if you really do make that change and make that impact and you inspire, let's say, even one other person, you and that person can collaborate together and do a lot of powerful things. Um, and I feel like that really, um, like my mentor, for example, I didn't think I could do this. I really didn't. Her name is Louise. And I say, we're going to Thelma and Louise this, you know, and, and we did. And we, we did not stop meetings after meetings, whether it was not supportive or not, we had a vision, we went there. What was the selling point was I looked at myself, right? I crossed the bridge and I'd rather pay a toll than pay a collaborator. New Jersey just lost one provider. And that was a selling point to a lot of senators. They're like, wait, you can do that? They didn't even know. So believe it or not, you can make a huge difference. And nurses are very outspoken in the healthcare field. I see it all the time. Problem is, how do you do it? got to get your colleagues, you got to get your buy-in, you got to get your numbers, and you got to do it in a professional way. You have to sell it professionally. Write out a proposal, um, a policy, a tentative outcome. After you implement that policy at your local institution, say, this was meaningful, this was impactful, and let me put it out there to the, to the rest of the state. Then maybe the state will put it out to the rest of the world. And that's how you make a difference. Don't let your, don't focus on the negatives because it could be so overwhelming. I can tell you in my experience, I have moments where I'm like, this is not going to happen. I'm wasting my time. And then there are moments like, I'm not giving up. It's like two o'clock in the morning thought. I'm not giving up. What if I do this? What if I do this? And you just go there and you, you run with it. Really speaks to the power also of professional organizations and not just being a member paying your dues, but actually being actively involved because then you can connect with those who may have had other experiences with this and can kind of help and like in your experience to help lead and guide you through. So I think it really speaks to our audience as well as as far as professional organizations in the state of New Jersey. Good point. So I just wanted to thank you again so much for joining us and bringing healthcare policy to life. 
Um, I know it's a topic that, um, you know, teaching and, and mentoring and, and kind of starting the process, it's, it's hard to think about the final outcome. Um, and we're still kind of dot, 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 waiting to see what the final outcome of this will be. Um, and where can we quick go? Where can we go to follow the progress of this of this bill as it moves through? So I recommend um, joining. I'm going to advocate for the society. <laughs> um, definitely the Society of Psychiatric Advanced Practice Nurses have has done a lot of tremendous, tremendous work, countless efforts, countless hours. Um, you can go on the website, follow the process there. Um, like I mentioned, um, NJ Ledge, um, you can look at the bill's process there. Uh, local organizations, like you mentioned, uh, Dr. Van Dyke, are so important. Um, New Jersey uh, Nursing Association, um, really this bill, it's in the major state where it had to be. It's going to go to the, hopefully, the assembly. And we have less than, I would say, nine months to get there. And I think that we can because we're halfway there. Um, a lot of battles ahead, but I believe and strongly think that we have a lot of support this time around. The pandemic did not give us a collaborating agreement. We were able to see what APNs really do without that. And it's, it's out there. It's visible. So it's just going to be a matter of time. Thank you so much for being our guest, for joining us, and for sharing your journey. And we hope that this will help to inspire our listeners uh, to start their journeys and to, uh, to continue on in health policy and making a difference. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. This podcast has been a production of Radio Felician, the voice of the Franciscan University of New Jersey. Visit us anytime at RadioFelician.com. Want to send an email? Reach out at radiostation at Felician.edu. Radio Felician, the Falcon.